okay, it's uh, time now to introduce our our facilitators or our speakers. Uh, there are two, as you can see on your screen. We have, um, and they're going to talk to us about uh, swing your belly, Midwest care for freedom, mobility promoting a dynamic birth. So I, before I hand over to them, I will have to say something little about uh, their work. So we start with uh, Inez. Please, Inez, raise your hand so that they can see you. Hello. Good. <laughs> Inez, Inez is um, Inez Rothman, or works at the research um, as a researcher. Sorry. Inez Rothman works as a researcher. We can't hear you, Mary. Yes, um, something went wrong uh, briefly here. So Inez Rothman, can you hear me? Inez yes. Rothman works as a researcher at the Flemish Association of Midwives, uh, focusing on strengthening evidence-based midwifery care. She recently led a development of a campaign, Move Freely, Swing Your Belly, Freedom of Mobility During Labor and Birth. In her own practice, Lava Yoga, Inez has been uh, fortunately supporting over the past seven years uh, parents and uh, children with yoga, mindfulness and body and body work from preconception to the first 1001 days of postpartum. She is a, a certified perinatal yoga teacher and works intensively with the craniosacral uh, therapy and perinatal. Uh, Inez grew up Germany but has been living in Belgium for the last 16 years as of now. So let's talk uh, also briefly about our next facilitator or uh, speaker that is uh, Liv. Please Liv, raise your hand, we can see you briefly. Uh, Liv uh, Brehaber first worked in the maternity ward and uh, delivers a delivery room for the last 20 years. In 1999, she started a home birth practice as an autonomous midwife in Belgium. Her calling lies within a physiological birth and women-centered care. Liv makes the con connection between caregivers around birth to improve their human rights in childbirth. Recently, Liv retired from the practical work. Liv has a deep knowledge of um, physiology in birth and uh, a critical view of protocols and guidelines. She fights for deeper knowledge in physiology in birth, midwifery led care, continuity of care, and for the autonomy of wife and midwife. Thank you so much. That is a, a short uh, introduction of our facilitators, and I need to uh, hand over to them so that uh, they take us away they take us they continue with the presentation okay well thank you mary for this lovely introduction and yes. um will you be at assigning the presenter role to me uh, or yes i have already yeah. given you the presenter role okay because i can't move the slides but otherwise i'll just give you a sign to um move the slides further ahead then Yes. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, Liva and, and I are very pleased to uh, uh, share some insights from our research, which we've undertaken at the Flemish Association for Midwives over the past um, uh, one and a half year. And we've done that research uh, together with a couple of colleagues, uh, which are listed here on the right. Uh, and uh, we derived uh, the findings, some of which I want to share today with you um, um, based on the campaign Swing Your Belly or Move Freely. Yeah. 
Um, the starting point of our research was that um, we were fascinated by the fact that uh, uh, a woman, a wild woman, moves during childbirth. Uh, she, when a woman gets all the space to um, follow her instincts, uh, uh, a woman swings her belly and swings her hips. She, she may dance during uh, childbirth. And uh, um, in order to deal with the labor pain sensations and to help her baby to um, move smoothly through her, bel her pelvis, and I'm sure um, you all have witnessed that uh, as well. Um, in practice, however, we um, see often that the healthcare context or the healthcare approach used um, may not always facilitate or hold that space for women to move freely. Sometimes women may feel ashamed to, to move uh, freely during childbirth or they just don't know that they can or are allowed to, uh, to move during child labor. And um, uh, and I'm also um, uh, you probably also witnessed that in the labor wards uh, that women tend to sit or lie down in bed and may not get out of it. Um, so that's a pity because there are many, uh, a lot of um, uh, advantages of freedom of mobility and some of which I'd like to share um, with you in a moment. Yeah. So what um, we uh, would like to achieve with that campaign, Swing Your Belly, is first of all to give that freedom back to women to um, uh, move freely during labor and also to give that freedom back to midwives to hold the space for women to move freely and to apply uh, their knowledge and skills to promote physiological labor. So what uh, what did we uh, how did we approach our uh, research? Well, we focused, as you see here, on four questions, um, and each of those questions we um, uh, try to answer based on the four pillars of evidence-based research. First of all, we looked uh, quite into detail uh, into the fact how do we define uh, that concept freedom of mobility. Secondly, we try to learn from the history of uh, uh, freedom of mobility. Uh, thirdly, we looked at the effects it has on maternal and neonatal outcomes, including the birth experience. And the last question we try to answer is what are then the factors, uh, the, the barriers or the promoters uh, of using freedom of mobility? And I'd like to uh, share um, or answer uh, question two to four uh, briefly, while uh, Leva later on will also uh, focus in much more detail on question number one based on her long-standing experience as an autonomous midwife. Uh, so what we've seen is that um, throughout history, women um, have always moved uh, during childbirth. They uh, uh, have used upright positions, flexible sacrum positions, as you see here on these lovely paintings and drawings and, and other artworks. And traditionally, childbirth has been um, a very intimate happening, a ceremony within the circle of women and supported by a wise woman, a midwife. You know? And it was from the approximately the 16th century onwards that a, a number of developments um, led to the fact that our view on childbirth and freedom of mobility changed. Uh, just to mention a few, the development of obstetric instruments, of uh, general anesthesia, um, uh, the twilight sleep movement, uh, all um, led, among others, to the fact that we sort of, uh, sort of more medicalized vision on childbirth emerged and that women suddenly all were lying down in birth in supine positions and didn't use movement that much anymore. And it was only um, half of last century that um, uh, increasingly more evidence-based research um, appeared and testifies of the many benefits of midwifery-led continuity care models and also of freedom of mobility. And so we looked at that research evidence. Yeah? And what we did is we did a review of that uh, literature. Um, we uh, included in our research um, uh, clinical six clinical guidelines, six systematic reviews, two RCTs, and a lot of other qualitative studies looking at uh, the birth experience over the past 10 years. And what we found there is that 
um, not surprisingly, upright and flexible sacrum positions do improve the birth experience. Um, the, in particular, the, the woman's sense of control and autonomy and confidence. Yeah? Uh, they also soothe labor pain con uh, sensations. They shorten second phase of birth. They decrease the risk of instrumental birth and uh, they promote better fetal positioning uh, due to the many biomechanical effects of birthing positions and they decrease the risk of abnormal fetal heart rates. Uh, so all that re research evidence is very encouraging and positive and we need to uh, share much more that evidence both with parents and uh, healthcare providers. Yeah. Uh, our re review of literature did find somewhat uncertain evidence uh, concerning other outcomes like the rate of C-section, perineal trauma, episiotomies, postpartum loss, blood loss, uh, as well as maternal and neonatal outcomes in case of epidurals. But um, I have to say that if you look on an observational uh, study level, we do find many positive effects, whereas on a meta level, we, we couldn't, um, well, the evidence was uncertain. What is important, and I'd like to point out that many of these studies have um, quite some limitations, especially with respect to the freedom of mobility, just to mention a few. Uh, the first one is that uh, we hardly can sort of capture the freedom uh, of mobility concept uh, by randomizing women to one or two positions. And because women move in and out all sorts of different positions all the time, and we can only know once in labor what positions may be beneficial. Yeah? And those studies can, um, well, it's very uh, difficult to capture that complexity in, in a randomized control trial. Um, another um, uh, limitation of the research study is that the care, healthcare context, the healthcare approach was very different across the studies. And uh, we sometimes just didn't know whether midwifery-led continuity care models were used or whether women could actually follow their instincts and be wild and uh, or whether the physiology of labor was uh, supported. Uh, um, so what we then did uh, uh, to do is to do some further research because as we've seen, uh, as I said, on the one hand, women want to move uh, if they follow their instinct. Throughout history, women have always moved. Uh, uh, the, re the research evidence is positive uh, and concerning the benefits. So why is it then that women still um, do not get sufficient space to, to move freely and intuitively. So we looked at, at all sorts of factors, barriers um, to using freedom of mobility promoters. And maybe given the time, I'd like to mention just a few. Um, the, one of the most important barriers is uh, also not surprising, is the over medicalization of birth. Uh, for instance, continuous electronic fetal monitoring uh, limits freedom of mobility, unless you're maybe uh, a rope jumping champion. But uh, um, if women are um, hooked to a monitor, obviously the wires limit uh, the woman to, to move freely. Sometimes women just don't know or feel obliged not to move if they are um, attached to a monitor. And so we looked at the clinical guidelines and also research evidence uh, of fetal monitoring and uh, all of them actually recommend in a low risk labor and birth to use, not to use continuous electronic fetal monitoring, but intermittent auscultation. And still we see that increasingly being used on uh, uh, in hospitals. Another one is epidural anesthesia. Um, obviously, depending on the dosage, women uh, are less mobile when you have an epidural. And here in Flanders, the rate is 71.2% 70 of women use epidural anesthesia. We do see um, a trend towards using lower dosages and, and a bit more modern uh, technologies. but. Um, uh, overall, the majority of women do um, birth with an epidural. And what is important here to realize is that we still have a lot of opportunities even with epidural uh, anesthesia. We need to encourage women to move also with an epidural. And there are possibilities if we adapt birthing positions and if women get much more support by their partners and their healthcare providers uh, to stay mobile.
Um, maybe just to mention others, of course, um, routine application of hospital protocols or protocols which do not focus that much on physiology, another barrier. The beliefs of healthcare providers is another one uh, to, if we are not used to um, watchful waiting, then um, we may feel more comfortable intervening in a situation which may not need management at all. Uh, another barrier is that student midwives, but also practicing midwives, um, have a limited knowledge of the biomechanical effects of birthing positions. Uh, they just don't get uh, enough opportunities uh, nowadays to observe what uh, is a wild woman and what kind of signals does a wild woman give in labor? How do we interpret that? Uh, um, and uh, we could turn those barriers into promoters, um, of course. Um, other promoters are, for instance, midwifery-led continuity care models. Um, at the Flemish Association for Midwives, we um, also just published a, a report on um, um, maternal and neonatal outcomes in case of birth, which were supported by autonomous midwives. Very interestingly, we also see there women in, at home, birthing at home or supported by the midwife are uh, more mobile, uh, using all sorts of positions. Uh, also more home-like birth environments and hospitals are interesting, using birthing baths and birthing balls and birthing uh, bars, uh, rebosos, stint lights, also things like that promote uh, more mobility during labor. And also multidisciplinary scenario trainings with other healthcare providers are very interesting in this context. And last but not least, um, um, of course, we also need to reach the parents and uh, raise their awareness on freedom of mobility. And that's why the uh, Flemish Federation of Midwives developed that campaign, Swing Your Belly, uh, to take home some of these messages to both parents and uh, healthcare providers. Yeah? Okay, then I'll pass on to Felisa. Okay. I was asked just to uh, tell you some stories about freedom of birth. Uh, uh, stories of women who give birth and uh, when I when I want to talk about it I see a lot of women pass during my uh, years in my career and I see for instance a little woman she was a very small woman uh, from Asian origin and she had a mass belly and she gave birth at home and when I arrived there she was running through the apartment from the one side of the apartment to the other side and the only thing i had to do was stay aside so that she had the room to move as she felt she had to do and she started running with every contraction and after contraction she takes some rest to breathe and then she started running again and at the end she ended in a door opening and she was standing there with her hands um, support, uh, supporting herself with her hands and she was half squatting and then she pushed and she pushed three times and I had a baby in my hands. So it was a very nice story. It was a baby of four kilos and he came right away. So uh, she birthed very easily because she had those mobility. When she didn't have the, the chance to move it could have been a very disastrous bird, but it was a very smooth bird. Now, another story that I see is when a woman was uh, giving birth for her third child and she was in her bathtub, uh, a large round, round bathtub, and bathtub, and she had uh, a lot of place to move and she was on her knees. And then at the moment that she started pushing, she started to turn, turn around and from hand and knees on her back and then back to hand and knees. And then when she was on hand and knees again, the baby was in the bath. So she, she needed to turn out of her baby instead of the baby spiraling out of her. She turned it around. 
Another woman I see, she was a really big woman, a tall woman. She was a big woman too. And uh, when she moved through during all the labor, it was the first child. And at the end, she uh, was also standing right up. And that's what my experience also is, is that a woman who is taller than usual or bigger as usual, she has much more comfort by standing up positions to give birth. Um, what I think also is very important is that as a midwife, you get so much signals on what's happening in the woman herself with the bird when you are just watching her to move. Uh, the movements that she does tells how the baby is in her belly, what the baby is doing, in what stage the baby is, and, and how uh, imminent the bird is or not. So what's the role of the midwife? It's just looking and watchful attendance is a very good term to do. Just being there and watch the woman and support her in what she is doing. So what the supporting was with the woman who was running through the apartment was just keeping aside. Uh, but sometimes you see that women are freezing in positions that they felt comfortable on a certain moment in their birth, but then a lot of things change in their bodies and they are afraid to change what they were doing. So then the role of the midwife is very, uh, um, in a gentle way, uh, trying to get them move again. So my question is then sometimes, do you feel you need to go to the toilet? for instance, and then they move. And during that movement, they feel again what they need to go on with the labor. So that was my little story at the heart, is a wild woman. The next uh, stories I can tell is sometimes uh, you see that the labor is going into maybe in the direction of pathology. And then it's very important that you can recognize what is normal in a bird and what's not normal in a bird. And that you, you can only learn by being there, being there, sitting there. I'm the knitting midwife. I love to be the knitting midwife. So I uh, was with women, I slept with women, I uh, knitted with women and I worked with women uh, as well. So once I had a bird and uh, the heartbeat of the baby was too high, uh, the baseline was too high and I was thinking what could be the problem. And so I say, we, we are going to try something if necessary, we go to the hospital, you know, but we try something, sometimes uh, a thing. And I let her lean forward and uh, I did shaking the apple tree with the rebozo because I suspected that the baby had a hand in his, uh, um, against his head. And it was pushing against the veins here and then the baby will give a higher heart pressure, uh, heartbeat. And so we did the shaking apple tree and with the rebozo. And uh, after a while, we helped her again upright and the baby was fine. And he was birthed. Uh, at the birth, he indeed, he held his hand against his neck, but it was not pushing anymore that he or something. And the baby was very fine at birth. Then, uh, an other bird I had, I remember, it was in the hospital and the woman was giving birth, but um, uh, she, uh, she was on the bird chair and her husband sat before her and I was behind her. It was a little bit of switching of positions, but I trusted that the baby bit, uh, will fell good in the hands of the father. So, but at a certain point when she was pushing and the head was nearly to be born, I felt that I had to say something to her. And I said very softly, when you feel that you have to go on your knees after the birth of the head, go and do it. Just feel what you need. And then the baby's head was born and the mother let me go behind her and she went on hand and knees and then the shoulders became without problem. And afterwards she asked me, how did you know that I would feel that? 
I didn't know. Yes. Uh, so I think also in labors that are going to pathology, we can do a lot of things with uh, movements and with helping the mothers to move. Then the third, the third part of um, what I think is very important is that we have to recognize the value of rest. When I hear midwives speaking and run, when I follow courses and so on, it's always going about doing, doing and going on and stimulating and so on. And I think rest is so much, uh, has so much of value. So I think then of a birth of a first child and it was a straightforward labor. And then she was feeling us to push and she, she started to push. And then we felt that we that the labor was going to uh, was slowing down. And at a certain point, the mother says, Liva, I don't feel it anymore. I don't know what to do anymore. I said, what you want? I want to go lay down and take some rest, she said. So I said, OK, you can do that. And she went to lay down on her side and she she fell asleep. And I was sitting in the kitchen and I was waiting at that point. And then after a while, I felt that energy was changing and I went to her and I was sitting near near her and then I was reading again and then at one point I looked at her and at that moment she opened her eyes and she, she says the baby is coming and she went again on uh, uh, sitting on the bird chair and the baby came and that was it so we don't have to push women forward we have to recognize the value of rest. I have, just looking, I had another woman and she was also in hospital and she was on hand and knees in bed. And I saw beautiful how, how the rhombus of Michaelis was um, coming up and the purple line was growing and that's the easy thing of women on hand and knees and when they feel safe enough to be naked. So uh, I saw that all ha uh, happened and I thought, okay, the bird is coming on. And then we saw that th the labor was also very um, fall of, no, the, the surges were strong. And then we saw that the, the contractions slowed down. And I saw that the rhombus of Michaelis disappeared and the purple line was also disappearing. I thought, okay, baby is going up again because he's not ready in the, uh, not all right in the, uh, the right position. And uh, so I asked the woman what she wanted to do and she wanted also to take rest. So she came out of the bed. She went on bed to take uh, a nap. She slept for half an hour or something. And then uh, the contraction started again. She went in the bath again. We saw the rhombus of Michaelis. Uh, coming up again, the the, uh, the pink line was there again, and then she gave birth in a normal way. So I think we have to look at women and see what they are doing, what they need, and rest is rest and and taking the time, and also in every time, uh, every um, moment of the labor we see that that pattern comes. We all know the, the rest and be thankful start, stage uh, before the pushing. But I think those stages are more than once in a labor. So we can that have in, in early labor, we can that have half the labor and, and so on. So we see that there are rhythms in birth as well. And I think it's important that we recognize those rhythms. So that were my stories. <laughs> I give the word again to Ines. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, just to sum up, maybe here um, um, and to continue on on Leif's, uh, lovely birth stories. Um, I think we can obviously find a lot of um, information in, in the research, but the real wisdom is in the birth stories and observing the woman uh, and what ha what happens during labor. 
and um, um, and then we were thinking, okay, what can we um, do at least here on on the Flemish side, and maybe that's something um, which sounds recognizable also on on your side. Uh, we uh, think um, that um, um, how we can how can we as midwives hold the space for women then? Uh, so what what needs to change? Uh, and these are maybe just a few points. Um, uh, which we came up with. And as, as Liefer said, you know, the watchful waiting, uh, the knitting midwife being with the woman, that's so important, observing the woman in labor yeah? and uh, being there with a beginner's mind every time and, and reading those signals, interpreting those signals to evaluate labor progress. Yeah? Uh, another one, which is maybe more on a skills level is that we feel that we maybe as, 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 as student midwives, as practicing midwives need to learn more about how to do vaginal examinations when a woman gets all the space to be wild, when a woman is maybe in a different position than lying on her bat, uh, back. And fourth, um, we think also generating or sharing um, that knowledge on biomechanics of labor and birth position is very un important, especially in, in the cases as um, uh, Lever referred to, when there may be suspected uh, labor dystocia. Yeah? And um, for us um, uh, at, the, at the Flemish Association of Midwives, we also developed a website, uh, obviously that's in Dutch, but uh, to, to raise the awareness about freedom of mobility. And if you are interested in learning more about um, the research which we've done, uh, which you've tasted here today a little bit, if you want to share your experience with, um, with this topic, with Liefa and with other colleagues at the Flemish Federation of Midwives, you can uh, either reach us through our social media accounts here um, listed. We've also developed a social media challenge, uh, uh, a dance uh, to, to um, help us spread the word. So if you want to um, uh, do that with us together, uh, post your own moves uh, during labor uh, or do this dance, which we've uh, um, posted here uh, on social media and uh, to get a little bit the, the vibe, the dancing vibe um, up and running. Yeah. Okay. Are there, um, well, that's from our side, I think, uh, okay. what we wanted to share. Huh? Um, and uh, maybe, well, let uh, Mary, maybe let's see at the at the chat whether there are. I saw questions? I saw the comment of Sheila, and she said what she does with the uh, students, and uh, that was what was what I did also when I had a student in my practice. They went with me, and we uh, we had a little uh, paper, and I post questions on the paper and uh, uh, the what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, what you think, what you uh, what, what you feel you want to do or and, and why should you do that? And then the student uh, answered also, also on the paper because I didn't want them to, to speak to me. We, we weren't chatting. But we talked through the, through the paper, and that was very interesting. Also, afterwards, to reread and to evaluate what they were, they were thinking and evaluating. Okay, um, I think our time is almost up. Uh, Mary, you uh, you give us a sign when we have to stop. Is there any other question? Molly O'Brien, thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm a follower of you and I admire all what you share on uh, uh, of knowledge. Thank you. Mark Red says we need to collect all this these position in the stories. <laughs> yes, that's my dream to collect all the stories of the births I attended. In 40 years, it was more than um, a lot that I can tell, yes. Thank you all for your kind words. <laughs> we were a bit nervous, but I think it was <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Liv and uh, Inez, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I think it's time to wrap up. We have already gone through some of the questions that have been highlighted on the on the chat. Uh, I don't think there is any that is not answered, but at the same time, uh, uh, just to wrap up uh, in a few minutes, uh, it's important to have freedom mobility during uh, childbirth. Um, this is uh, basically from the evidence shared uh, by our two sisters uh, that um, uh, freedom of freedom of um, I mean freedom of mobility improves the birth experience. We have it also soothes uh, labor pains. It shortens second phase of birth. It decreases the risk of um, abnormal birth. Uh, some of the factors that have have also been highlighted in the discussion include barriers and promoters. Maybe I can share a few. We have over medical. Um, some of the barriers include over medical, uh, of over medicalization of birth, and then uh, limited knowledge and experience. Um, we also have the promoters integrating knowledge into the curriculum, um, and also awareness uh, raising, targeting parents, which is uh, one of the very key points. Um, uh, the experiences uh, shared and the short stories uh, shared by you ladies were awesome. And then um, it's also important to take time to check on any woman who is in labor. You also need to monitor uh, the stages, uh, especially during birth. And also, uh, this was one of the parting short wisdom is in the uh, real stories and observation during that time. So, uh, huh. Good Maybe tips. Mary. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Go on, please. I just wanted to say that if um, because I see in the chat that there are a number of questions about the presentation or the the research. Um, if yes. um, participants are interested in um, getting um, all the underlying research articles and uh, and the stories and other materials we we collected, we're very happy to to share that. And I put the um, our email in the chat. It's info at uh, fruitfrauen, which means midwife in Dutch. Dot uh, be. And if you send a message or you just contact us through the social media, then we are more than happy to 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 share that but also uh, if you feel like like talking or chatting more about those birth stories and and sharing through that the the wisdom i think uh, leave will be more than happy to do that as well yep 